full topological phasing to destabilizer codes. So thanks, uh, Daniel, for inviting me to this nice conference. This is a work that uh, is a collaboration uh, with uh, David Poulin, who couldn't make it to this conference in the last minute. And uh, one of his students, Guillaume Duclosiancy, who will be giving a related talk uh, on Friday. So this talk is about uh, topological codes. And well, since although we have already heard about them, let me remind you that the idea is that <coughs> in a topological code, qubits are in some sort of uh, manifold. And uh, in such codes, the check operators that we need to measure to recover the error syndrome are local so that they just involve uh, a few neighboring qubits. And at the same time, uh, local operators have a global, a global nature so that uh, any operator that has a support on a region that doesn't see the global structure of the, of the manifold won't be able to recover any information about the encoded states. So in this talk, uh, I want to uh, take a systematic approach towards these uh, codes and try to understand under certain constraints what is the, the general structure. In particular, I will be focusing on two-dimensional systems and which are uh, translationally invariant in a certain sense and defined by, uh, uh, well, system, qubit systems with uh, the, uh, codes, the stabilizer codes. So uh, uh, topological codes are given uh, as families of codes <coughs> and uh, in all the examples that we, that we have, uh, so the, uh, the code will uh, cause some, um, some bulk and then Maybe there will be boundaries and other defects, but uh, it's always the case that this bulk is uh, translationally invariant. So our approach is to classify codes according to this uh, to this bulk, so that it, we, you know, we can forget about all these different defects and so on. Now, of course, uh, such codes are uh, closely related to uh, topologically ordered models. So, in particular, I, ca I can consider such a Hamiltonian, which is a sum of uh, the uh, stabilizer generator. And the idea is that the ground state corresponds to all these guys having uh, eigenvalue one, so that the ground state, it's, uh, or ground state, the space of ground states, it corresponds to the code subspace. And the excitations correspond to uh, error syndrome. So whenever one of these uh, negative eigenvalue, I will have a uh, and excitations with, uh, with two units of energy. The ground state is, of course, the generate, just as the, as the code. And uh, from this uh, property of topological codes, we get that the ground states have, uh, are locally indistinguishable. So this is, basically, this is a property that defines topological order. And there is a nice uh, perspective on topological order introduced by Sengu and Wen. So what they say is that Topological order describes the equivalent classes defined by local unitary evolutions. Let's see what they mean by this. So what they argue is that if we have uh, two gaps uh, ground states, they will be in the same phase, stand only if they can be connected uh, adiabatically without closing these gaps. And then this amounts to them uh, be, be, to be connected by uh, uh, local unitary transformation, or for us, to the existence of some uh, quantum circuit of constant depth, constant in the, in the size, uh, respect to the size of the system. <coughs> okay, so more pictorially, what they, what they are saying is that in order to classify topological codes or topological order, what we are doing is classifying uh, long-range entanglement patterns. So for them, a short-range short entanglement pattern is one, so it's, uh, you know, something uh, some state that we can transform through local operations into a, a product state. And other, other, other states will have uh, long range entanglement and will be, uh, so and the, you know, this long range entanglement will be defined by these equivalence classes up to local transformation. So we have uh, two main goals. The first is to understand uh, the structure of two dimensional topological stabilizer codes, including uh, subsystem codes that are so close, not so closely related to 
this topological order that I was uh, discussing. And then in addition for subspace code, which have the Hamiltonian uh, analog, we would like to see that uh, whenever they have the same, same structure in a certain sense, we can uh, transform one into another uh, through local transformations, as we should uh, according to this uh, prescription by, by Wen and collaborators. Okay, so here's the outline. I will start uh, explaining the role of onions in the Tory code very briefly. Then I will uh, go to the main result, which is uh, that the Tory code is somehow universal for two dimensional codes. And then I will jump to subsystem codes, which have uh, quite a nice uh, algebraic structure. Okay, so uh, what is special? Well, there are several things special about two dimensions. But uh, one of them is that um, there are uh, two logically distinct ways to exchange uh, two particles, either identical or not. And uh, so the idea is that if I exchange them uh, in this way or in this way, I cannot, uh, the two processes cannot be deformed one into the other without the word lines crossing. So this gives rise to the possibility that uh, there could be some uh, topological interaction that distinguishes between these uh, two paths. And the uh, particles that uh, suffer such or, or are subject to such uh, topological interactions are called anions. So the simplest case is that of uh, abelian anions, which are all we need. And such models are described by uh, three, uh, uh, three elements. So we have, uh, first of all, a set of topological charges. These charges are um, equivalent of, uh, of uh, sort of excitations. So if I take a given region and I have a given uh, you know, configuration of excitations, I could apply some local transformations and uh, get another set of excitations. And as I move, uh, you know, as I do this transformation, I will move in a certain equivalence class and these are, these are the labels for these equivalence classes. So that charge is something that is conserved in a region unless it's exchanged with some other uh, outside region. So the second, uh, oh, sorry. Whoops. So the second element will be fusion rules that tell us what is the, the total charge uh, given uh, uh, of, of two regions given the uh, individual charge of each of them, okay? So in the villain case, this amounts to basically a product. Okay, so the, the idea is that diffusion rules will tell me what is the total charge given these two charges. Okay, and finally, there are some braiding rules that uh, tell us what happens uh, as, as long as topological interactions are involved when I exchange uh, two onions in, a, in one of the two possible ways. Okay. Let's see this in the, this very relevant example, which is the guitar story code. So uh, I would like to emphasize that in the story code, we can visualize Pauli operators, which are products of, of X and Zs, are graphically, so that an X will correspond to a, a direct link and a Z to a dual link, a link in the dual lattice. And this way, uh, both, uh, both uh, kind of terms in the Hamiltonian or uh, check operators, uh, we can, can be regarded as, as plaquet, okay? So, uh, two kinds of excitation, yes, excitations in this model. We have uh, excitations in dual plaquet that can be created uh, by uh, uh, such uh, spin operators, which are products of X operators here. Okay, so the idea is that whenever I apply such a string, I will not change the, the even or odd number of, uh, whether it's an, uh, an odd or an even number of, of such excitations. And similarly for the direct plaquet, sorry, this would be a direct plaquet, it's neither a dual or a direct plaquet. Uh, okay, and the, the idea is that in total there, is, uh, there, are, there are four charges, so I could have an even number of both dual and direct excitations, then I'm in the trivial sector. Uh, if I have an odd number of the dual ones, I say that I have an electric charge. If the odd number, if I have an odd number of direct ones and even number of these, I have a magnetic charge. And then finally, there is a charge which corresponds to the case where I have an odd number of, of both. So 
So basically, they, these are baby encodes the fusion rules because uh, any charge composed with itself will give me the, the trivial sector. And I am only, I only need the, the topological interaction. So to recover them, we can use the fact that these uh, charges are created at the, as endpoints of these strings and recover the topological interactions from the uh, commutation properties of the spin operator. So if this is a sort of, a, let's see, a, I guess magnetic string and this is an electric one, they will anti-commute. And then I can consider two processes that are product of these spin operators. And when seen uh, in time, developing in time, one of the processes describes, uh, so in both cases, the, the two, uh, the electric and the magnetic charges end in the, in the same place. But in one case, the paths are, the word lines are linked. In the other case, they are not. And we can see that a minus sign appears differentiating the, the two. So this tells us that these two uh, charges have uh, are semions. Okay. And then we similarly can recover the, uh, the self statistics or topological spins, which tell us what happens when I exchange two, two, particle, two, two charges of the same type. So in this case, we will need uh, three strings with a common endpoint. So in the case of electric and magnetic charges, they are bosons, so it's not a lot of fun, but uh, the composite turns out to be a fermion, and this can be checked uh, this way. So notice that the composite will be uh, moved from one place to, to another through uh, such uh, uh, spin operators, which is uh, the product of, a, of a, an electric and a magnetic uh, strings. And I take three of these, and then by uh, the idea is that I have an anion here, one anion here, and then by ordering these operators in two different ways, I can either, either exchange the two excitations or leave them where, where they are. And the difference, again, is a minus sign. Then, of course, we have the, they are fermions because when you exchange fermions, you get a minus sign. Okay, so the main message is that we have some uh, Hamiltonian or some, some code, and we have extracted an abstract anion model from it in this case with four charges, certain fusion rules that correspond to the uh, C2 times C2 group, and then some braiding rules. And everything can be recovered from the spin operators. This is the, this is the main message. Okay, so now I can jump to the, to the main results. So, uh, first thing that we need is to abstract ourselves from a family of topological codes to a single stabilizer group that's uh, defined in an infinite lattice. So, you know, for this family of codes, there will be some recipe to construct the bulk and we just apply <coughs> it to the infinite lattice. Now, of course, this, this resulting stabilizer will have some properties because it comes from, it comes from, a, from, a, topo from, to from a family of topological codes. It cannot be just any stabilizer. And uh, we must remember that uh, in a topological code, Local and detectable errors should not affect the uh, encoder states. In other, case, in other case, it wouldn't be topological. And let's see what that translates into. So if I have some uh, Pauli operator here in the infinite lattice, and it communes with all the stabilizer generators, we can find uh, an element of this family, infinite family of code, that is big enough so that this guy fits in the, in the bulk. And then it will also belong to the, uh, to the centralizer of the stabilizer, from which it follows that, uh, from this code being topological, that uh, P itself belongs to the stabilizer. And then, well, without going into details, it's, uh, it's possible to show that either P belongs to the stabilizer here, or we can assume that it does, actually. Okay, so the message is that we have this condition that the centralizer of the stabilizer is up to faces the stabilizer itself. And this is the topological condition that we impose. So these are the two ingredients, translational invariance and this topological condition. And then we want to classify all these guys. So uh, we seek to be able to relate code through local transformations. And indeed, it turns out that it's enough to consider the following ones. First, we have uh, a cross graining of the lattice, which basically amounts to doing nothing. It's just looking at the lattice from a different, different perspective. We have uh, local and translational invariant uh, Clifford mappings so that we map 
the public group to itself. In fact, uh, locality in this case, in the infinite library, follows from the translation invariant. Given, given that I am only considering the public group to, be, to consist of uh, operators with a finite support. And then, uh, finally, I would like to be able to add and remove disentangled qubits. So qubits that have their own uh, single qubit stabilizer so that uh, from the perspective of the topological code, they are not uh, interesting. Okay, so it's easy to see that given these three uh, transformations, by combining them, one will, so if, if, my, if my code has a certain annual model, suppose, then this annual model will not change to this transformation simply because uh, it's described from with the spin operators that can be arbitrarily large and so on. But the interesting thing is that the contrary is also true, and whenever two codes have the same annual model, they can be transform one, one into the other through this, uh, through this basic operation. Then, uh, if we rule out the possibility of so-called chiral onions, uh, which, uh, which we can do according to Kitaev, then one arrives to the conclusion that, but I will give more details, that every two-dimensional topological stabilizer group in this sense is locally equivalent to a finite number of copies of the, of the toric code, which is uh, our main setup. So let me give some clues about the proof of this. So well, first of all, there are two uh, technical boring results, but very important. So uh, first that in 2D, for these uh, stabilizer groups, we can find a set of uh, uh, independent generators. Okay, so that from the, if you translate it into the symplectic vector space, uh, you know, formalism, <coughs> I'm just saying that there are no linear constraints between them. So the thing is that in 2D we can find <coughs> such a local and translational invariant independent generators, and this is actually not true in 3D, and uh, it, if it is true, I mean, it, in the proof, it also, we also use the fact that these stabilizers are the centralizer of something, actually, of themselves. So if, it, if it, that was not the case, maybe it, it, it wouldn't be true, this property. It can, it can be not true. So this is the first technical things. Technical thing. The second technical thing is to show that the number of charges is finite. And once you have this, it's very easy. You just uh, uh, obtain the annual model by constructing the spin operators and checking what are the you know, spin mutation properties and so on. And then once you have these spin operators, you construct a, a framework, a series of lattices made of uh, string segments. We'll see how. And the framework of a string segments, uh, the resulting uh, plaquette stabilizers are give uh, all the uh, give generators for the stabilizer, uh, give all the, all the generators for the stabilizer that have charts, and then the rest of generators have no charts. And then the mapping between two uh, codes where we have done all this would amount to map these string segments to the corresponding string segments with the same charts, and all those uh, extra and charts uh, stabilizers, we map them to single qubit stabilizers. So they are decoupled from the, from the code. So some small details. So first of all, we need to cross-grain the lattice till um, at any site <coughs> we can find uh, any possible charge until whenever we have two, two sites with uh, so excitations here in this site and this site with a given charge that is equal, and we can pass between them. If we cross-grain enough, we are going to be able to construct an operator with uh, support in this uh, gray region here. So just a bit thicker than the path, such that it creates these two excitations. So this is what we mean for a string operator here. We can define them for arbitrary paths. And once we have string operators, we can recover motor statistics and topological spin with the trick that I already explained for the Tori code. And to see that this actually makes sense, consider, for example, that we have these two pairs of String. So they, they should have the same commutator, right? And to check it, we can extend the, the picture of it. And now, I have these closed strings. Since they have no endpoints, they create no excitation, so they belong to the stabilizer, up to a phase. And therefore, the two of them commute, the, the two commutators are the same, and thus uh, this, sorry, 
this guy here is well defined. It's independent of the choice of the, of the strings. And similarly for, for this other guy here. Good, so once we have uh, our new model and uh, the topological interactions, we can find a set of sort of canonical generators for the, for the, for the group of charges. And this is what one finds. So there will be a certain number of uh, pairs of generator, each of them. So uh, this uh, charge here will have some unique uh, mutual statistics with this other guy, and both of, neither of them uh, interacts with any other generator. And then all of them are bosons, except maybe the two, the two last ones, which could be both uh, fermions. Now then, each of these pairs corresponds to the anions in the toric code. Okay, so we have several copies of the toric code, and then maybe uh, this chiral part with pseudomid. In any case, we can construct uh, several lattices of, of operators. Okay, so this will be large operators after you know all the or the, all the cross graining and everything. We will have some string operators here forming a square lattice for each uh, charge, and each of these lattices, so they are displaced a bit with respect to each other. And the, the reason to do so is that we want uh, the, the commutators to depend between all these string segments. We want them, we want them, these commutators to depend only on the anion model, not on details of the of the strings. Okay, so that's the reason to do it that way. So we we end up with uh, this collection of string segments that are have that have commutators that are independent of the original model. It's all, only the model. And then, in order to do the mapping, we will just uh, so here we have uh, two codes. In each of them, we did all these procedures, so we are back to these lattices. And then, for each lattice, uh, so for example, I will have this uh, num uh, first, uh, say, electric charge, and the corresponding one in the on the other code. And I will map uh, string segments to string segments, and then. Uh, it's possible, so there, there will be, apart from the stabilizers coming from, from plaquettes, I will have other stabilizers, but they have no charge, and they can be uh, mapped to single qubit stabilizers. I will not go into any more details. Okay, so let me move on to the subsystem case. So, well, we have heard of this, but just very fast. In a subsystem codes, rather than encoding in a subspace of the Hilbert space, we, we will just take a subsystem. These are our logical qubits and then each qubit about which we don't care. And in the case of uh, in the, in the stabilizer formalism, uh, as described by Poulin, we are still describe our subspace through a uh, stabilizer. But then in addition, we have a gauge group whose action does, doesn't alter, uh, doesn't affect encoded state. And the important thing is that the stabilizer and the gauge group are related uh, through this condition so that up to phases, the stabilizer is the center of of the gauge group. Now, in the topological case, what we mean for a topological uh, stabilizer subsystem code will be a family of codes, each with a stabilizer and a gauge group, and both of them have local generators. Now, again, we, are, we want to extract the, the, the recipe for the bulk and put it in an infinite lattice and obtain some stabilizer and some gauge group. As before, we want to impose a topological condition on these guys. And in this case, whoops, in this case, if I have Pauli operator here that commutes with all the stabilizer generators, when I carry it to a large enough code, it will also commute with all of them. Therefore, it will belong to the gauge group now. And uh, one can see that, again, this implies that we can assume that uh, the gauge group here contains this, this Pauli operator. So we are left with this condition that the gauge group is the, uh, the centralizer of the stabilizer, so it contains all the poly operators that commute with, with the stabilizer generator. But once we have this condition, we could just as well define the gauge group through it, and then we get uh, a condition on the stabilizer that uh, guarantees that our, well, not guarantees, but that we need in order to, to that becomes our topological condition, right? So it doesn't the gauge group anymore. And it's that the centralizer of the centralizer of the stabilizer, it's, uh, 
is in the sense of stabilized adaptive phases. So of course this would be trivial in a finite, for a finite number of qubits, but it's not, necessar not necessarily true in the case of uh, an infinite light. Okay. So the main obstacle to to move the, to, to, to such a gate code from charge space code is that we need to generalize the notion of charge. So the trick is to make it a bit abstract. So remember that charge uh, classifies equivalent classes of uh, excitations up to trivial sets of excitations that can be created uh, by applying some poly operator. And this we can abstract a bit by considering that our configuration of excitations are actually, or if you want, the syndrome possible syndromes, with morphisms from the stabilizer group to, to, to situ. And uh, the trivial morphisms will correspond to those that can be obtained as a commutator with some, some Pauli operator. So this quotient will give the group of, of charges for the stabilizer. But now that we have this sort of slightly more abstract definition, we can generalize it immediately to the, to the gauge group. We just substitute S with G, and we have a new group of charges. Well, that, that don't have the same sort of uh, obvious meaning in terms of states or anything like that, but are very useful. And we still have the uh, the old charges for the for the stabilizer group. So we have two sets of two groups of charges, and we could, uh, as before, try to define topologi topological interactions between them. So consider, for example, so in order, in order for this interac uh, interaction to make sense, remember that we have this trick, these two uh, closed spin operators that have to commute so that it didn't matter which pair of spins I took to define the, the sort of interactions, right? So consider, for example, that I have a, that this, uh, the charge of these strings came from the, from a, from the, from the, from gate charges, right? So it's a gate charge. So in that case, Having a closed spring means that this guy will commute with all the gates uh, operators, and therefore it will belong. Th this closed spring will belong to the stabilizer. Similarly, if I have a string with a stabilizer charge, this means that it, uh, uh, the closed spring will commute with all the stabilizers, and therefore it belongs to the gauge group. So in this case, the two strings <laughs> commute, and the two commutators are the same. This would also be true if I have taken two gate charges because then I would have two stabilizers, they commute. But if I, if I laser charge and a, uh, another stabilizer charge, I will have two gauge elements and then they don't necessarily commute, so I cannot define such you know, topological interactions in that case. So what we are left with is that for two gate charges, we have the well-defined uh, mutual statistics, we have topological spin, and we also have, whenever I have a gate charge and a stabilizer charge, I also have this, uh, this mutual statistics. But nothing else, so I don't have a topological spin for stabilizer charges nor interactions between them. So really I, ca I have an annual model for the gate charges and then uh, I could regard this as uh, some sort of vortices for these onions. Good. So of course um, I can map gate charges to stabilizer charges simply because amorphism from uh, G to C2 can be restricted to amorphism uh, to C2. I will uh, graphically depict this this way so that uh, a gate charge is a circle with some color and then the image will have the same color and, uh, and a square shape. And it's, well, this is uh, a natural uh, morphism. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on any choice of generators or anything like that. And it will preserve uh, this, uh, this commutator so that <coughs> if I just, if I have two gate charges and I map one of them, I will get the, uh, the same commutator. Of course, I cannot map the two of them because then the, other, the, the thing in the other side is not well defined. And as in the case of subspace codes, again, I can find a, a canonical set of generators for the gate charges and for the stabilizer charges. Let me first discuss the gate charges. So we have first a sector that looks very much like what we've had in, uh, in subspace codes, several bosons, and then maybe uh, a chiral pair that now uh, can, can actually appear. 
And in addition, we have something new. We have several bosons and maybe one fermion, all of them non-interacting, so they are not, they are not anions. <coughs> and uh, then for the stabilizer charges, we can find the same number of uh, generators, and this is because actually there is a duality between, between the two. So, well, this should be ordered in a different way. So the thing is that this stabilizer charge interacts only with this guy, but not with any other one. Similarly, the black one here with the red one here, so on for these guys. And then I have these stabilizer charges that are not the image of anybody here, and uh, they are dual respectively to the, to the charges with the, with the same number. Through the morphism, if you want this uh, map to be uh, to the trivial charge in the, in the stabilizer. Okay. So uh, there are many annual models that we, that we could have, uh, but all of them can be obtained by combining four basic ones. So the first of them correspond to what we find the, in the Tori code with these two bosons with uh, with some unique mutual statistics. Then uh, the second one is the same, but with two fermions, so that well, the, the three non-trivial charges are fermionic, and this can be found in topological subsystem color code that were that were discussed by by Robert yesterday. We could also have a single boson. This can be recovered from uh, what I call the subsystem Tori code, which would be a Tori code where to the stabilizer we add to to get the gauge group we add uh, all uh, single qubit X or C operators, whatever you want. And we can also have a single fermion, and this is what we get if, if we look at the at, at he types uh, honeycomb model as a subsystem code. So in these two cases, actually we have no encoded qubits, okay, but it's, I mean, they, they, this fits into the classification and actually it's, it's important to keep it, even though it's not useful from, from the encoding point of view. So once again, we can uh, construct a framework of uh, spin operators, and we would like to recover the uh, stabilizer and gauge generators as plaquettes of these of these lattices, and we can do so. So, uh, in the case of the of the gauge group, it's possible to find a set of uh, in the uh, of generators for the gauge so that include these these plaquettes. So this would be coming from the lattice that where strings have this charge, okay, and this is the the dual charge, or, well, I should better say conjugate in this case. Uh, so the thing is that this is the charge of the, of this plaquette in the, in this, in this uh, uh, basis of, in this set of, under this set of generators, similarly for the, for the, this one here, and then uh, we also have generators that have these charges with, uh, uh, which are not uh, anionic, and they come from uh, plaquettes made up with uh, strings uh, that have a charge that corresponds to these guys that were not, uh, well, you know, that were dual to this, to this other guy. And similarly for the uh, stabilizer. So that uh, the idea is that the rest of uh, generators of the, either the gauge or the stabilizer will have um, a trivial charge. Okay, so this, the idea is that with this, we put the, the codes in a standard form, and therefore we can see that all codes can be understood in terms of, of these anions. In addition, uh, we could put uh, this, this lattice back into a finite system like a torus, and then once is, well, what you expect, that you have again, uh, that the homology gives you the, uh, the logical operators and so on, so each of these pairs will contribute uh, two qubits in the code, in the, in the torus, and these guys contribute nothing, and in addition they have a problem, is that uh, when put in a, in a finite lattice, we need to add either uh, a gauge or a stabilizer generator that are global, and you need to add one per, uh, per one of the generators, and per, uh, non uh, per generator of the uh, first homology group. Yeah, so the lesson is basically this, that we can understand two-dimensional topological subsystem codes in terms of anions. And 
Yeah, so with that, let me just uh, leave some questions. So first of all, uh, we have been considering just the, the bulk, but we could also look at the defects in the, in the code. So we could have uh, a code with several different bugs uh, put together, or either of these could be just a vacuum, the end of the code. So we have boundaries and we have point defects. <coughs> but we can also classify this uh, potentially using this, this tool. So th we could go to a setting where we have two semi-infinite planes, each with uh, different representing a different bug. So this is translational invariant. Then we have a boundary that is translational invariant in this direction, and then we have some point defects. And this way, we could uh, classify all such possible things up to local transformations and so on. Of course, we could consider more general uh, two-dimensional codes. And finally, maybe the most uh, best, the most exciting is going to 3D, because as we know. Uh, as we, as we learned uh, this morning, I think. There are much more uh, exotic uh, things waiting for us there, so the classification is, is more than just uh, homology. Okay, so that's it, thank you. So, questions? So, uh, I have a question. So, so what's the defining property of the to the topological stabilizing code. So do you assume the locality of the operator and find a distance because you didn't specify it at the beginning? So uh, all you impose is the locality of the stabilizer generators and then that, so you will have a family and then you impose that uh, any operator, so you could do it in different ways, but the idea is that uh, there will be always a large, a large uh, codes in your family, right? So when you go to large enough number, where any operator will be local in the sense that it doesn't affect that. And so your, your coarse-grained operators are limited in width by their distance. So the coarse-graining we only do in, you know, in the infinite lattice and so on. Yes, but they are limited in size by the locality of the stabilizer generators. Uh, you mean whether, wh you whether have, what's the limit on the course required course graining? Oh, okay. Let's see. Uh, so there is there is a limit, but yeah, I cannot tell you. Like you know, there are many steps in the proof that are just like okay, there is some course graining that will give you this, but I mean, like it's a bit involved. It's so what? so there is there always exi I mean, there, you can put a bound on what course graining you are going to need depending on the yeah depending on the size of the generators, but I cannot tell you like expression. It is possible to give it. Uh, for the standard stabilizer case, uh, was the condition that the centralizer of the stabilizer is modulo faces the stabilizer? In the infinite lattice. Yeah, so yeah, that's exactly what I'm asking about, sort of the encoded operators. I mean, what, what about, a I mean, do you put a sort of a size I mean, is it on, on the entire group or elements of bounded size? So this appear, the, the encode operators will appear when you go back to some finite code. Yes. But not, not of course, in the infinite lattice. So the infinite lattice is just a picture. The, the idea of going through the infinite, to, to the infinite lattice so is that everything, everything becomes yeah. local. So everything is automatically local, so you don't have to care about. That's why I wasn't careful in defining you know, locality or anything. I mean, you, so the, the thing is that whatever definition you take, it will basically work. And then once you go to the infinite lattice, to everything is local. And then it's, it's easier, I don't know. OK, thank you. Other questions? Thank you. The speaker.